Hi there, Andrew Dunkley here. Thanks for joining us on Space Nuts Q&A. This is the um, separated second half of what used to be a, a, a big podcast. But we've decided to break it up uh, because of uh, audience feedback mainly, and that uh, enables people to uh, absorb the show in smaller chunks, which seems to be much more palatable for most. So uh, we'll um, carry on with this and see how it goes. Coming up on this episode, we're going to be answering questions about Planet Nine. We'll also be uh, chasing up uh, Rusty's solar pergola. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? Well, Rusty's come up with a follow-up idea. And David's got a what if question for us, uh, which I've had to do some research on because I honestly couldn't answer it until I did some homework. And I hope Fred's done some homework too, but he might have a better idea than I have. Uh, and a, a bit of homework uh, as well, uh, following up uh, questions from Wayne and Lee. Wayne asked us about uh, supernova. Um, uh, supernovas causing gravitational waves, yes or no, and how uh, InSight is able to triangulate uh, impact points of um, uh, of things hitting the planet's surface. Uh, Lee wanted to know about that. So we'll be doing all of that in this episode of Space Nuts Q&A right now. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us again is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. It's a coincidence, Fred, that we're both still wearing the same shirts as we did in the last episode. I mean, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> it just means we're pretty scruffy, really. Yeah, we're <laughs> very rough around the edges, indeed. <laughs> Mine's a space nut shirt, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to drag mine out because um, when we, since we moved, everything's sort of in different places and I, I haven't really gone looking for them. I know they're probably not far away. I know they're not in that wardrobe behind me. Because it's just <laughs> that's just full of junk. We had to put it somewhere. Um, yeah. Let's uh, get stuck into it because uh, we've got a few questions uh, to deal with and a bit of homework to follow up. Our first question comes from a regular Duncan's. Hello, it's Duncan here from Weymouth in Dorset. Um, just another quick question for you. I was just wondering with the Planet Nine episode and. So far, we've not been able to find it. Um, also, with all the rogue planets that have been found recently, is it possible that in the past a rogue planet would have come through our solar system and, or at least near to it, and perturbed the objects out in the Oort cloud and the um, Kuiper belt so that they present this strange orbit that they've got now and that the rogue planet would have then gone on its way back out of our solar system and therefore there is no planet nine to be found but the objects still exhibit the strange orbit into which they were perturbed just thinking you know is that a possibility so we're looking for something that might no longer be there okay Thank you anyway, and uh, thanks for the good work, and keep it up, and all that. Thank you. Bye. Uh, all right. Um, interesting idea. Um, so possibly a rogue planet or something else passing by that caused some interference that created the anomalies that we now blame a planet on that may not be there. What are your thoughts? Uh, yes. Um, I, so um, that's all... Uh, possible. That's all oh, possible. <laughs> wow. But but I think uh, it's been basically eliminated by those uh, people who are studying the orbits of these uh, distant uh, trans-Neptunian trans -Neptune trans objects. They're called uh, extreme trans-Neptunian objects, the ones whose orbits are aligned. Uh, so I think... My feeling is that that, if I remember rightly, so there were papers published on this in 2016 and 2017. They were the kind of original uh, pr um, proponent papers of the idea that there has been, that there is a, another planet in the solar system. Uh, um, co-authored by Mike Brown, who's one of the main proponents of this. Uh, now, 
I, if I remember rightly, those studies looked at, uh, you know, exactly these ideas that they've been uh, more likely to be a passing star because the, the the sun does wander near stars as it meanders around the galaxy, uh, and those stars do have a gravitational influence. Uh, we believe, for example, that. Um, uh, and, and this is not a star, this is something even bigger, a giant molecular cloud. But one of the theories uh, that uh, looked at the bombardment of the Earth by comets, done by colleagues of mine in Edinburgh back in the day, um, they uh, looked at the idea that uh, giant molecular clouds had, had influenced the Oort cloud and basically dumped uh, comets into the inner solar system, which meant that there were uh, episodes of bombardment on the Earth, which they found evidence for. So, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's an idea that is kind of well known in astronomy, that the, the, the Sun uh, is fairly lonely at the moment. The nearest star is Proxima Centauri, 4.3 light years away. But there may well have been closer encounters throughout the history of the sun. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that this sort of thing was looked at in those early papers. Uh, but if I may, um, to segue to a new paper that's come out, and this oh, is well. featured actually um, by uh, our good friends at Universe Today, uh, the Universe Today website. Um, they, are, I think, have had a, a chat with uh, Mike Brown, um, who's um, he's actually the Richard and Barbara Rosenberg Professor of Astronomy at Caltech, uh, and he's uh, certainly uh, the, the, one of the main proponents of this. Uh, they've done some new research, and they've narrowed down the area in which we should be looking, um, uh, which, uh, you know, is is really uh, a step forward because the searches that have been carried out so far have been over a very wide area. I think they've narrowed it down. I can't remember to how many square degrees it is, but it's narrowed down. And this is in in advance of the Vera C. Rubin telescope coming online, Andrew, which is going to be the, the world's most effective survey telescope, it's an 8.4 metre telescope that will look at the whole sky. It's every, is it every three or four nights? The entire sky. Wow. Because it's a wide field telescope. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Planet Nine will be high on the agenda of objects to be looking for. Mm. Um, uh, by that telescope. Uh, a couple of quotes, if I may, from um, uh, from uh, Mike Brown. Uh, planet Nine would be the fifth largest planet in the solar system and the only one with a mass between the Earth and Uranus. Such planets are common around other stars and we would suddenly have a chance to study one in our own solar I, I, system. I would have thought that mass would be your legs. <laughs> More or less, yes. Yeah, Geordie liked it. Geordie gonna, liked that joke. Yeah, Geordie likes it. Yeah, I'm not going to touch it, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and another another quote that I like. There are um, there are too many signs. This is Mike Brown again. There are too many signs that Planet Nine is there. The solar system is very difficult to understand without Planet Nine. Um, and he goes on to say. Uh, again, uh, talking to Universe Today, Planet Nine explains many things about the orbits of objects in the outer solar system that we would be otherwise unexplainable and would each need some sort of separate explanation. The cluster of the directions of the orbits is the best known, but there is also the large perihelion distances of many objects existence of highly inclined and even retrograde objects. That's uh, things that orbit the wrong way around. Uh, clockwise as seen from above the North Pole. It's the wrong way around. Uh, and the high abundance of very eccentric orbits which cross inside the uh, orbit of Neptune. None of these should happen in the solar system, but are all easily explainable as an effect of Planet Nine. Right. So uh, Dr. Brown is still very much the proponent of Planet Nine. And, um, well... Does Planet Nine exist? Uh, and we will find it in coming years and decades, as Universe Today asks. Only time will tell, and that's why we do the science. Yes, indeed. Uh, although uh, there was one theory that it may not be a planet, but uh, a, a cluster of stuff. Have they written yes. that off? Uh, a cluster of stuff has been one. Clusters of stuff are very difficult to hold together, Andrew. Right. Uh, and so it needs to be something solid. But... Uh, uh, a mini black hole has also been suggested, and that might be something that's more difficult to eliminate. 
Right. Wow. Okay. There you go, Duncan. Great question and very timely given there's some new information. So uh, thanks for sending it in. And uh, we, yeah, we continue our search for Planet Nine. Not me personally. I'm going to leave that up to other people. But, um, you know, I, I occasionally take a peek. <laughs> to see if a telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Should, yeah, yeah. yeah. My 3.5 will find it. It's not 3.5 meters. It's 3.5 inches. Um, but no, it's actually, I don't know. Might be in, I don't know. Um, I can't remember what size it is. Isn't that terrible? Uh, thank you, Duncan. Now, uh, we've got a, a follow-up um, concept, let's call it, from Rusty about his solar pergola, which he told us about a few weeks ago. This was aimed at reducing the Earth's exposure to the sun by around 2%. Um, and he, he sent us an email about it. Uh, and he said, I, I'm afraid I gave you and um, Fred and Andrew the wrong idea. Although I briefly considered a megastructure at L1, I rather foolishly thought calling the sunscreen I have in mind the solar pergola would garner some interest. It may have done that, but it also gave people the wrong idea. What I do have in mind is a constellation of Starlink proportions. Uh, each satellite would throw a um, penumbral shadow on the Earth, and the total 2% sunscreen would not be noticeable. I'm convinced that using emerging technologies, uh, we could have this done in 10 years. What do you think of that, Fred? Um, oh, it's good stuff. Uh, and Duncan is... Uh... Rusty. Sorry, beg your pardon, Rusty. <laughs> Sorry, Rusty. Sorry, I'm mixing up my listeners, uh, uh, all of whom I'm a big fan of, by the way. Uh, so yeah, but um, there's a lot going on in the you know in the scientific world along similar lines. And in fact, only was it a fortnight ago, three weeks ago, as we stand now, there was a big article uh, in the New York Times, and I think it was also picked up in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, entitled "Could a Giant Parasol in Outer Space Help Solve the Climate Crisis?" Now that's um, sort of a bit of a reference to the megastructure idea that uh, Duncan. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Rusty. Let me just write down Rusty uh, was thinking about before. Uh, but that article was good because it pointed back to a lot of the earlier research that's been done on this. And indeed, um, there's, there's papers everywhere. Uh, one that I liked was, goes back to um, scientists in the University of Hawaii, uh, who uh, wrote uh, a paper back in July last year uh, about the idea of a sun umbrella, in other words, you know, a parasol, uh, tethered to an asteroid in order to give it some sort of stability. Uh, so once again, it's a megastructure, but it's got an asteroid uh, tethering it. But, um, and this is probably disappointment to Rusty, uh, the, the one that essentially is identical to what Rusty is suggesting was written by somebody I know, actually, a scientist called Roger Angel, who is a professor, I think he might be now retired, uh, at the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, he um, published a paper in the Proceedings of the National a a Academy of Science uh, back on November 14th, 2006, which is feasibility of cooling the Earth with a cloud of small spacecraft near the inner Lagrange point, L1, which I think is exactly what Rust is suggesting. Mm. And I'd actually um, uh, suggest to Rusty that you actually look at this paper. It's pretty easy to find. PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, Feasibility of Cooling the Earth with a Cloud of Small Spacecraft Near the Inner Lagrange Point. And he goes through the mathematics, the stability of spacecraft at the Lagr Lagrange Point, because it is actually a gravitational saddle, which means they wander off if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, do something about them. Um, let me just read a few things from his abstract. Uh, if it were to become apparent that the that dangerous changes in global climate were inevitable despite greenhouse gas controls, active methods to cool the earth on an emergency basis might be desirable. The concept considered here is to block 1.8% of the solar flux with a space sunshade orbited near the inner Lagrange point L1 in line between the earth and the sun. Following the uh, work of Jay, Jay Early, uh, another early, if I can mix metaphors there, uh, worker on this back in 1989, um, he says transparent material would be used to deflect the sunlight rather than to absor 
absorb it to minimize the shift in balance out from L1 caused by radiation pressure. So there are some real subtleties here, Andrew. Um, three advances aimed at practical implementation are presented. First is an optical design for a very thin refractive screen with low reflectivity, leading to a total sunshade mass of in the region of 20 million tons. Second is a concept aimed at reducing transportation cost to $50 per kilogram by using electromagnetic acceleration to escape the Earth's gravity, followed by ion production for propulsion. Some neat uh, work there with uh, basically with light sails. And third is an implementation of the sunshade as a cloud of many spacecraft autonomously stabilized by modulating solar radiation pressure. These meter sized flyers will be assembled completely before launch, avoiding any need for construction or unfolding in space. They would weigh one gram each, right. be launched in stacks of of 800,000 and remain for a projected lifetime of 50 years within a 100,000 kilometer long cloud. The concept builds on existing technologies. It seems feasible that it could be developed and deployed in a region in the region of 25 years at a cost of a few trillion dollars, mm. uh, less than 0.5% of the world gross domestic product over that time. So um, you know, Rusty's thinking is very much in line with uh, what Roger Angel was proposing, except Rusty now thinks we could get it down to 10 years because of uh, the new technologies that we have in space launch, and that might be absolutely right. Yeah. Look, we've got to do something because um, from what I've read about the progress we're making in dealing with the problem of global warming and climate change on Earth, um, we, we we can't possibly do enough to alleviate the effect. Um, and, you know, not every country's conforming. So it, 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 there needs to be another way. And maybe maybe this is it. Just maybe. Yeah, mm. I'm not a big fan of um, major geoengineering, but... Um... Yeah, as you say, uh, we we really have to uh, step on it in regard to what individual countries are doing. Yeah, plus it increases our classification as a civilization in doing so. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> For anybody who happens to be watching. Yes, yes. Well, it's important. It's very important. Uh, thank yeah. you, Rusty. Um, yes, you've, we've now given you some homework, so um, have a look at that. Okay, we checked all four systems, and uh, with a go. Space Nuts. Uh, let's move on to our uh, last question before we do our homework. This one comes from David. Hey, friend Andrew, this is David from Seguin, Texas. Um, got one of those favorite kinds of questions, what if? Um, if y'all could step foot onto any planet outside of our solar system, which planet would it be and why are you more interested in that planet than others thanks for your show bye all right david um well aside from planet nine um i <laughs> which is you know we're not sure if it's part of our solar system but it, it's got to be it's just so far out um i i i'll go first because i haven't got much to say but i did a bit of homework on this and i, I thought, thought well, well if we're going to step onto another planet we really want to find a planet that's earth-like and that took me to the Kepler system. And the one mm. that they think is most Earth-like, even though it's 60% larger than Earth, is Kepler 452b, which I like the idea of until I read that it's probably got a runaway greenhouse effect and it's developed more like Venus than Earth. But uh, they reckon that is probably the most Earth-like planet so far that they've found outside our solar system. Uh, I wouldn't mind having a look at that. Um, Setting foot on it might prove a challenge, though. But uh, I mean, there's there's so many planets that they've discovered now. Most of them gas giants, so you know you don't want to step on any of those. But um, any any rocky planet in a Goldilocks zone would probably be attractive to me. And Kepler four five two b is in the Goldilocks zone, Fred. So there you are. Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe so. But uh, yeah, it is it is a um, a strange world compared to what we know, and the, the drawn the comparison to Venus. But um, uh, it's probably it's in the Trappist one system, I think, um, discovered by the Kepler yeah. Space Telescope. Yeah. So um, that that one sort of jumps out at me. But I did have to do homework because I I honestly haven't really analysed what we've learned about too many exoplanets. 
uh, but it would have to be Earth-like and it would have to be in the Goldilocks zone. That's I'd, I'd want to have a look at any one of those, really. Um, and yeah, mm. that, that's exactly the way my thinking went as well, Andrew. Uh, the uh, and I'm not sure of the distance of the TRAPPIST-1 system, um, but I went for... Um, it's 40 light years away. Yeah, okay. So um, that's just too far for me. I'm getting old and I'm not <laughs> sure I could too make Too far 40 for most years. people, I think. Yeah, so I'd be going to the nearest star, <laughs> Proxima Centauri, uh, 4.3 light years away, which has does have uh, Proxima Centauri B, uh, which I think is in Proxima Centauri's habitable zone. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think it's an Earth-like planet, uh, but it is within the habitable zone. Uh, and um, the problem with planets going around red dwarfs, which Proxima Centauri is, is that they're irradiated by the flares that these red dwarfs tend to emit from time to time. Mm. And so... Um, I would have my radiation shield uh, on full power uh, and be sitting there watching what the effect of uh, a solar flare, a gigantic solar flare is on this poor little planet uh, around the nearest world. But uh, what I'd have in the back of my mind is it's not too far to get back to Earth because uh, it's only 4.3 light years yes, away. Yes, Well, <laughs> you know, when we get our light speed uh, engines all sorted out, that's... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, yeah. it's still a long trip though, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, it is, yeah. mm. All right, David, there you are. Your what if question answered somewhat, and thanks for sending it in. Uh, now, to some homework. We uh, were asked recently by Wayne whether or not a supernova can cause a gravitational wave, and the answer is uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did I know that? Yeah, uh, so it depends on how symmetrical the explosion is. Uh, in other words, if you know, if you've got a perfect explosion, uh, everything goes outwards completely radially from the centre, uh, then you won't get a gravitational wave because all the acceleration, accelerating masses are balanced. Uh, you know, it's balanced. Uh, the ones going away from us are balanced by the ones coming towards us, so you don't get one. Mm. But if you had a, an asymmetric uh, supernova explosion, and I think most of them probably are. I remember seeing some simulations years ago of uh, of the gas dynamics of a supernova explosion. And yeah, there's certainly looked as though there was a lot going one way and not quite as much going the other way. So that would give rise to a gravitational wave. Okay. Yes. There you go, Wayne. Uh, yes, sometimes is probably the answer. Yeah. Uh, and Lee asked us about uh, how InSight uh, on Mars was able to triangulate the impact point of meteorites and other things hitting the surface. Uh, we had to follow that up. We did, and um, I did that. Uh, because... Yeah, I was going to, but you offered. <laughs> um, because I thought it was an interesting one. I'd kind of wondered the same thing myself. And you might remember, Andrew, uh, that I did waffle about the fact that seismic waves are not just, uh, you know, they're not just one uniform thing. They've got different frequencies. They've got different polarizations. There are shear, shear waves and what's the other? Pressure waves and shear waves, the two different sorts. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and I think, I think I might be sort of have been vaguely on the right track. Uh, I'm going to read, though, from uh, someone's answer uh, to the question. This is on the... Um, uh, uh, Stack Exchange website. Question was, can we know where the Mars quakes came come from in insight? And actually, uh, the question, I'll read it out because it puts it exactly. When doing seismology on Earth, we use information from multiple stations to determine where a signal is coming from using triangulation. On Mars, we only have one seismometer in sight. Is this enough to get a very rough idea of where the Mars quake occurred? If so, how is it done? And the answer is uh, from... Okay, okay. It's from somebody I actually know. Oh, I did, I've had dinner with him. <laughs> uh, Tom Spilker, who's Linda Spilker's other half. Tom is a space engineer and very good space scientist. So I think we can um, we can take this with some gravitas. I hadn't noticed that Tom was the author of this of this answer. Uh, so Tom's answer is. Um, according to this paper by the Insight Seismometer team and. This paper has a link to it, so you can click on click on it. Um, 
it's the SE, SEIS uh, team uh, with a list of authors as long as your arm. Uh, that sounds like Tom. Uh, techniques combining data about the arrival times of various modes of seismic waves, the amplitude or strength of the waves, and surface waves that travel around Mars's globe more than once can determine the location of Mars quakes. My reading of the paper, this is Tom again, is that the process isn't a straightforward calculation, but instead involves modeling of Mars's interior structure and wave propagation characteristics, adjusting the models until a coherent solution is reached. That solution includes the depth and geographic position of the quake's focus. Oh, so right. a gr great answer by what a delight to find um, find who it's from as well. Mm. And that that includes impacts because Mars uh, quakes yes, happen. Right. So yeah. Just a bit, yeah. Yeah, anything right. that causes the the right kind of vibration will. Yeah, by modelling you can you can work out mm. where it's come from. Fascinating. Yeah. There you go, Lee. Um, that's how it's done. Uh, now, don't forget if you have questions for us, please send them in via our website. Just uh, click on the AMA tab where you can send us a text question or an audio question. We actually have very few audio questions at the moment, so please get them into us. Uh, you can also click on the uh, thing on the right hand side. The, the greenish, tealy, sort of spearmint coloured button. Uh, send us your question, although when you hover on it, it turns purple. Um, and it, just as long as you've got a device with a microphone, um, you can record your message. And don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. And while you're on our website, have a look around and see what you see. Fred, thanks so much. Uh, we'll catch you on the next episode of Space Nuts very, very soon. Sounds great, Andrew. Take care and talk to him. Okay. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and Hugh in the studio, who's got more editing to do than a Disney um, cartoonist person who does <laughs> Disney stuff. I don't even know what they're called. Animator. All right, I'm out of here. Uh, thanks for your company. Catch you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.